All right, everybody, we want to take a second to talk to you about an amazing sponsor. We have an amazing relationship with RayAllen.com. Ray Allen is a one-stop shop for everything dog, not just working dogs. Everything dog that you need, you can go down there, check them out, RayAllen.com. Awesome people. They got everything you need. Another one of our favorite partnerships is with a dog tra- They've been with us from the start. Uh, great callers, great ball poppers, great GPS tracking. Big dog, small dog, bark collars, everything. I got everything like that they have at the kennel. We'll use it every day. Be sure to head them up, dogtra.com. Listen for a discount code later in the episode. Hey, guys, it's going to happen. August 16th through the 19th, HITS is coming back. The HITS Canine Conference in Orlando, Florida, August 16th through the 19th. Get on there. It's the biggest, the best. Check it out. HITSK9.net. HITSK9.net. Get registered now. Take the guesswork out of making sure you're feeding your working dog correctly by using Kinetic Dog Food. Hit them up at kineticdogfood.com and look them up on the Instagrams at Kinetic Dog Food. Take all the guesswork out and do it right from the beginning. We love Horizon Structures. Dude, this stuff is so awesome, man. You can get online. You can talk to them. You could build it you want from mild to wild. They'll come bring it to your place, set it down on your pad, hook up your power, hook up your water, and you can put dogs in it that day. If you don't believe me, check out some guys like uh, Justin Rigney. He's got a great setup there. Ask him. Check him out, horizonstructures.com. All right, we are back. Working Dog Radio, broadcasting the bite. Uh, I am Ted Summers. Uh, from Tulsa, Oklahoma, as always. Um, with me is Eric Stambro from Canton, Ohio. Eric, what's going on? Well, you can tell uh, I'm in a different room <laughs> this time versus yeah. my bedroom. This is my spare bedroom because um, I was having issues with my new computer. Then the lights went out randomly. I must have a short, so Ghost. moved over here. Um, <clears throat> I did it yesterday, too, once. But um, plugging away, I've got um, just... Yesterday, drove. I was down in uh, Winchester, Virginia for a little while, and then went over to Dallas Airport. And I picked up three Springers. Um, so he, so this is what happened was, I uh, I sold all the dual purpose dogs in my kennel. Right, I had one left, and I met the agency in uh, Winchester. They picked them up, three of the four that they're getting from me. And um, so I'm like, I'll take a, I'll take a second and get uh, get some single purpose dogs. And uh, uh, talking to Cameron Ford a lot, he's really having good success with Springers. <clears throat> I haven't, I haven't trained any Springers in like three years. So I had a couple I trained. They worked out great. So I said I'll get some. Our guy Milan over there in Germany had picked some up in Italy, sent them. Well, in the interim between when he was getting the dogs and the two weeks between shipping, I sold nine more dual purpose dogs. I, I have zero. So I got to, <laughs> I got to get some more. I'm meeting up with David. I think this coming Friday <clears throat> getting some, but I don't have nine kennels either. So I only have eight. It's just a whole, whole lot going on. I was uh, down in Georgia with uh, the Georgia police canine foundation guys and Howard young. And um, yeah, I saw that. I, yeah. Neil had some good times down there. That was fun. Um, I'm going to Indiana two weeks to the uh, up to Miscatatuck um, to teach up there, the same search and rescue slash law enforcement seminar I did last year. I'll be up there. I guess they got some new stuff for us up there. So that'd nice. be cool. What's, what's going on over there? Uh, more of the same, more pets, more police dogs. I sold some more police dogs, got some out the door. I uh, got a couple delivered. And then um, Today is uh, March 22nd, and over the weekend, we learned that uh, somebody in the can industry, uh, Tony Smith, passed away. Uh, Tony had been around since like 1985, four, seven, I don't know, a long, long time, like almost 40 years, uh, Little Rock Canine Academy. And uh, yeah, so uh, that sucks, and uh, it was unexpected, so... You know, we're thinking about him and his family. And, um, but yeah, I mean, he, uh, there was a lot of dogs in this area, um, from him, a lot of dogs all over the country from him. Um, but because of that, um, there's been some, um, there's been, there will be kind of like an uptick because nobody knows what's going to happen. And I've, I've gotten text messages and phone calls and like, what's going I was like, dude, I don't know. Like, I haven't talked to the guy in like six years before, you know, I last time I talked to him like six years ago, but, so, um, 
that ought to be interesting, but we've sold quite a few uh, police dogs. In fact, like I'm running the same problem you're running into now. Like I don't have enough room. <laughs> I'm like, I gotta get these dogs done <laughs> and get them out and get them to the department. So uh, working on those single purpose pointies that uh, go into a jail, uh, they should be done here pretty quick. I've got a green plus dog that I'm going to be delivering probably right before I go up to HRD. We scheduled two more HRDs for uh, Florida in November, uh, which I'm excited about. Fort Good Myers, choice, Florida. Man. Yes. Not, not, not Buffalo. Uh, not, not that, not, yeah, not that Buffalo was bad. Just I don't want to go back in November. <laughs> it was so fucking cold. God, that was terrible. Great, had a great time, great dogs, great teams, but God bless it was cold. I now know how cold it has to be for these headphones to not work. <laughs> yeah, Buffalo. <laughs> and it's whatever the, whatever the temperature was while I was there. God damn it, it was cold. Uh, but outside of that, uh, and we're still plugging along on the whole, uh, the, the concrete floors got completely polished, refinished, and sealed which was nice. fun because it was like Tetris, like moving all the stuff mm -hmm. inside, like it moved off the side into the side. So I spent a week moving stuff around, uh, which is terrible. But now we got my training floor back. And um, side note, apparently during COVID, um, people on Etsy decided that lockers make cool craft projects. They paint and live, laugh, love all over them, apparently. So what I used to buy for 15, 60 bucks are now $300. Hmm. Yeah, so uh, thanks, Etsy, for fucking up my detection program. <laughs> so I'm having to kind of fill in some gaps and trying to figure out how I'm going to fill that in. So uh, that's been interesting. But yeah, um, so who do we have tonight? Well, you tell me, man. You got the, you got the whole thing right in front of you. I do. Um, so this is one of these interviews that the name has come up like several times and i don't know like the stars never aligned and there was other stuff going on and she um, she just big times us she just <laughs> yeah exactly no no <laughs> <laughs> yeah she's like i'm busy yeah. um so we have on tonight and i i don't even know like how to introduce you other than just your name it's sonja nordstrom um and it's your background sonya, sonya sorry <laughs> i'm sorry <laughs> it's sonja nordstrom That's and okay. it's a yum 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 <laughs> so give us a little bit of your background like what are you doing now and then we can talk about it because i mean you work for the fbi and you were working at the pentagon like after the terror attack like there was all kinds of stuff in your resume i was like holy cow okay so <laughs> let's yeah, start it's like it's been kind a of like... long and winding long and winding road right yeah. um so right now i'm sort of technically retired and dabbling in several different things um, I retired from the FBI. I was a special agent for 23 years. I retired eight years ago. And I opened a dog training business, as everybody does. Um, in addition, throughout this whole thing, I started working with a search and rescue team in 95. So that's when I started um, with the dog stuff. So I'm president, trainer, whatever, of a local search and rescue team, Great Basin Canine Search and Rescue. And we train regularly and you know keep everybody up and going and certified and everything. And then I'm just maybe starting in on doing some rubble work with my dog because I'm working my number six dog, number five fielded dog, but number six dog. Um, and then I've got this couple of other little things going um, with Steve Stoops, who was one of your guests. Um, Steve and I have known each other for about 20 years. And so we have uh, sort of just getting this American Tactical Aggregate K9 uh, thing going yep. and doing it some detection. So I'm sort of more the detection side, obviously, and he's the tactical side. Um, so my thing is detection and, um, yeah, so there you have it. And you also host <laughs> a podcast. Uh, and I, and I, during COVID I'm like, whatever. Right? Um, yeah. So I'm not a very, I'm not regular. Like you guys, I kind of poke it in here. I'm like, Oh, I'll talk to somebody else. So it dawned on me that, you know, you guys do more of a training background kind of, everybody else does sort of more like training podcasts. And I thought I have met over the last 27 years, some of the very coolest people in all of canine. And it's kind of frowned upon to brag on your dog. But there's a mm. lot of great stuff that's happened, right? So that was my idea was canine top tales and tales being stories, right? And um, and it was just sort of an opportunity to kind of reconnect with people, to share their experiences, and to let them brag on these dogs that have done unbelievable things. So it's 
you know, I've, my first guest was Linda Porter, who's totally awesome and has done like the tracking poachers in Africa thing with John Lutenberg. The two of them are unbelievable. And then um, been doing the military guys, the combat assault dog guys, um, search and rescue people, FEMA handlers, the old time people. There was somebody I wanted to get and sadly I love him dearly and he passed away. So I didn't, you know, I missed two people, believe it or not, that got sick and didn't make it. But um, so that was the intention. So it's not, I'm not like driven in it. I'm just like, yeah, I need to talk to this person and just sort of let them share um, the greatness of their dogs. Cause there's so many people out there with great stories. And also when I started it, it was COVID and there's a lot of negativity toward law enforcement. And I'm sorry, the people I worked with are awesome and they're out doing awesome things. And I thought this is kind of a pro let people know what good stuff is out there, right? So that was the goal behind it. I don't know yeah. that I met the goal, but that was the goal. <laughs> I, I subscribed to you a little while ago. Um, I like your, I like what you do. I like the historical stuff. I mean, it's obvious when when you had uh, Steve Stoops on that um, you guys go way back. Like you, yes, way, way know way each other's dogs <laughs> from way way back, and um, that stuff's pretty cool. Cool to listen to. So, um, where'd you grow up at? In Boston. In Boston. So if you want the full history, I'm a nerd. I grew up outside of Boston. I was playing the violin. I went to Indiana University as a performance major for violin. Oh. And then realized not a good future for me and not what I love. So then I became an electrical engineer. And then I did that for a while. And then I'm like, not loving it. So I became an FBI agent. And when I went into electrical engineering, it was maybe in the back of my mind becoming an agent because it was one of the programs that they'd let you in as. So that was my path. Did you grow up with dogs? Yes, I was. the. It, it's so funny because when you look at kids, right, every picture of me, I'm touching a dog or touching a pony. Every single one. We had a collie when I was a kid. But my childhood dog, you're going to love this, and it taught me never to get one of these again, from age of six to 22 was an Afghan hound. Oh. And I had that thing pulling sleds, jumping lawn furniture, doing healing patterns, not because he wanted to. I mean, it was healer method for sure, right? So anyway, he was funny. You'd throw a ball, he'd just look at it and say, and why would I ever do that? So, <laughs> and, you know, they run away and they have to be fed. So I loved him dearly. I, I absolutely cherished him. Um, but then I learned what real dogs can do. How so, big was he? He was 65 pounds, which when I was seven was a lot like, yeah. you know, <laughs> but he, um, he actually was out of these incredible champion lines and my aunt and uncle got his brother and he was glorious. You know, he was, he never growled in his life, um, intact as you know, it was different then. Cause you know, I'm kind of old. Um, so yeah, that was my childhood dog. And you would have thought it would have tainted me against ever having a dog again, cause they just run away. But, um, and then I, when I became an agent, I picked up um, a collie off the freeway. Cause I had picked up a dead a dog that died the day before. And so I picked up a collie off the freeway, went from farm to farm. Cause I was stationed in West Virginia and there was a puppy in front of me. So I took her and that, that was my first dog and that I got her in 92 and then was taking her to all this obedient stuff. And then I found a SAR team and she didn't make it. So I learned uh, a lot. <laughs> I don't know if I've ever asked you, Ted, did you, I, so I, my mom was like a no go on dogs. Um, we had a little dog. I was probably three. I think I remember, unless I dreamt this, it may not have even actually been real, but I was like three, we had a dog. Um, and one day she ran away. And uh, never oh. saw her again. We didn't have any more dogs till my sister got some. And we were like, I was like 20 when that happened, I think. How about you, Ted? Uh, yeah, I had dogs when I was a kid. Um, and I trained. I did a bunch of obedience stuff. I did some AKC stuff with a, I had a chocolate lab named Claire that uh, I did stuff with. I think there's a picture floating around on me on Facebook with wearing Vans and like some kind of stupid puka shell <laughs> necklace and like my blonde <laughs> hair. And I dress the same. I mean, you know, I'm like 40 something now. I dress the same as I did when I was eight. So, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I had that. I mean, when I was a kid, I had those, I had that. Uh, and then when I was in high school and in college, I had uh, a couple of Jack Russell Terriers working Jack Russell Terriers that were 
They'll kill some stuff. Awful. Well, we used to take them out. So back when downtown Tulsa was scary, we used to take them out and drink beer and let them kill rats. That was that was fun. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that was the best. Like Friday night, we didn't have any money. We'd just load a backpack up full of beer and ride our bikes downtown with dogs and let her kill shit. <laughs> That's <laughs> funny. Whatever. <laughs> Sonia, it's interesting um, that you said uh, that you had a collie. Because when I was a kid, collies, oh. there was a lot of them. And you don't even see them anymore. No, we just... So I have 10 trainers on the pet side and we do hundreds of dogs a year. And, uh, one of the guys, uh, one of the trainers stopped in, uh, with one of his new training dogs and it was a collie. And I'm like, it was a great dog. And, it, but I was like, I haven't seen a collie in years and years. And that was the first one we trained in my, my company. He was the classic lassie the big rough collie same coloring not the exaggerated nose like they are now with the beady eyes but what's interesting is the dog i picked up in west virginia was a collie and so when i showed up at the farm they said oh that's my dog's mother and she was a beautiful little thing but the mother was a flat coat you know the short coated kind yeah yeah and then the baby i think you know West Virginia is known for beagles. So I think the dog I got was a collie beagles before the DNA. Phenomenal agility, great hunt, great nose. I don't feel like it was her. <laughs> she was like, she didn't have a workout. She's like, yeah, I already found him. And it's just a little stressful for me. So we, we, I beat my head against the wall for two years. And I'd like to say she taught me a lot. I taught her very little. Um, we called her princess bear bear. She was either evil or lovely. And so it, it was a good, you know, whatever. I loved her, of course, and she died of old age. And and when I stopped working her, I got a good dog, you know. And um, and I bring her to the police dog training, and she flirted with the boys. She hated other dogs, but the boys, the intact German shepherds, would flutter like a butterfly for them. She was just, and that mm-hmm. was her joy. So I'd bring her out to training. She'd flutter for the boys, get them all excited, and then I'd put her up. So it was kind of fun. It's funny, uh, memories you have when you're younger. So I, when we talk about collies, I always go back to, there was a guy, family that lived down the street from us and they had a collie and that guy had a little riding mower and that collie would bark and bite at the car, at the tires of the mower, the entire (laughs) mowing of the yard, up and down, back at the front tire of all whole, the guy never ran over the dog. I couldn't believe it. Or it didn't get sliced up. (laughs) He never, he never stopped. He would just go up, make the turn, come back, go up. make It was like. The dog just bought the whole time biting the tires. <laughs> I was like, I don't want that. I, I don't ever want that. Well, the crazy thing, we ended up with the Afghan because my parents, you know, I was five when he died, when the collie died, but we got the Afghan because my parents wanted a Sheltie because they wanted the same dog, but smaller. Mm-hmm. And the breeder of the Afghans had just switched from Shelties to Afghans. So we saw this crazy, and it was back in the seventies, like the hippie dog, you know? Mm -hmm. And when all the bikers were going, we were up in New Hampshire going back and forth and they're like, whoa, look at the hippie dog. So it was kind of that groovy time in the early seventies. And um, so we ended up all summer going and visiting this breeder and we ended up with this crazy little monkey dog. He was the cutest, I don't know. I loved him, Mm -hmm. I love them all. So when you get in the FBI, what's your first duty station? Was West, West Virginia. Virginia. Can you believe it? It was the, um, I was at the groundbreaking for Sieges, which is the fingerprint facility. So mm-hmm. they were doing background investigations. We did more backgrounds out of our office than the whole bureau put together. And it was everything to staff that Sieges, which is 4,000 people. Senator mm-hmm. Byrd got it going. So I did a year there and then I went to Pittsburgh. And in Pittsburgh, oh. I was there for four years and I was doing crimes against, I, I started working crimes against children before I owned my own personal computer. And it was when Innocent Images National Initiative started and they were, AOL was trading child porn. And so we were sort of, it's when postal service used to do it because it was snail mail. Mm -hmm. And then it went over the computers and the FBI. So I was the coordinator for the division of Pittsburgh to work the internet crimes against children. And then I worked it, when I moved to LA, I worked it. And then I finished my career the last, so I did about 12 years of that. And then in the meantime, I did violent crimes and I did bank robberies in LA, which was a blast. Oh, yeah. Ted, do you have you ever fun. met anybody who's worked at crimes against children, either on a local or federal level? Yes. I it's have. It's horrible. And they're <laughs> like, 
It's I rewarding, I'm sure, but yeah, fuck. I'm like, I don't want to hear it. Like every anytime somebody's like they're a canine handler and like they're super proud of like the finds that they have with their dog, whether it be explosives or narcotics, and then or whether it's tracking or even when you have single purpose tracking dogs that find like like in this context of this conversation, like people that have live finds that are successful, like after a disaster. Like I love hearing that. But that shit, like I don't know a friend of ours uh george um down at marion county like worked us that for a little while mm -hmm. and man some of that stuff i i nope <laughs> there are definitely people that belong in jail 100 <laughs> oh, yeah. yes. there are some motherfuckers that belong in jail for a very very long time yeah. and, and, and that's yeah and now what i mean you're there on the ground floor of it so like back and when i was still at my before i retired from the police department um for years a good buddy of mine joe that i got hired with he did um juvenile crimes as in juvenile victims or juvenile um offenders. subjects right yeah. and then and and that was bad enough but we have another guy that work works there and he's been on uh, a task force with the fbi for gosh i want to say maybe 10 years now yeah M maybe even longer I, I will say this about it it's insanely motivating and and for the fbi um there are agents seriously they're doing intel they're doing whatever and they never really get to put cuffs on anybody like they'd send them out with me either on the bank squad or because we were actually doing things and i it was a little bit fun when i'd take somebody into the lockup and of course all the marshals know me because i'm there once you know every <laughs> all the time they're like everybody knows you i'm like yes i'm good at this you're going to jail <laughs> so it was kind of there was a little joy in that right because they're thinking oh what's a girl she doesn't know anything i'm like no uh, and i sort of played the role of mother so i'd tell them if you need to cry you need now so you don't do it in a lockup you know so it was it was um very very rewarding i have my former partner he's done it probably longer than anybody and we were like warriors, man. We would go in like, let's go, you know, it's, it's motivating. And you you have to set, you have to compartmentalize, right? And then of course, in my spare time, I find dead bodies. So there must be some screw loose, you know, <laughs> that those are my, that's my, yeah. <laughs> there's something. You probably were like, there. this is a good grave. I could put uh, so-and-so in here when. Uh... <laughs> so when you were doing that, did you, um, so my buddy Joe was already a good interviewer, but he turned into a master interviewer. Now he didn't have so much the, um, you know, the computer evidence and everything. His was mostly actual, yeah. actual local. Actual, stuff. Yeah. Yeah, did yeah, you, yeah. did it turn you into a better agent doing those stuff? Um, well, believe it or not, bank robberies in Los Angeles, the bank robbery capital of the world. Right. So that was a lot of good interviewing skills. Um, I also happened to work, I, I worked in three RAs and three main offices. So I was in, you know, Clarksburg was an RA, Pittsburgh was a main office. Then I was in LA as the main office. And then I was, I was the senior resident agent in Lancaster. Then when I moved to Utah, I was in Provo. And then I ended in Salt Lake. So I did sort of six offices, but it's three main offices and three little offices. Um, but when I was in a little office. There was a, there was an agent there who was nearing retirement, was getting his PhD, and he's a master interviewer. He wrote this really good book on interrogation. So we would brainstorm stuff before we're going to do an interview. We'd prep it, we'd role play it. Um, learned a ton from him. A lot of good statement analysis stuff. It's almost a curse when you're dealing with other people because if they say something, you're like, yeah, that's not true. Um, mm -hmm. So these are developed skills, and I'll tell you behaviorally. I don't know if that helps the dogs or if the dog stuff helps that, but the dogs, like I did the pet stuff. I've done the pet stuff. I'm sort of leaning away from it, but you've got a fearful dog fight or flight. It's the same thing with the suspect, right? So you've got to lower the demeanor. You've got to chill it down. You've got to build rapport. You can't, it's a pressure on pressure off. You come driving mm -hmm. in like a dum dum, they shut down and they lawyer up. So it's i don't know which one fed which you know what i mean yeah uh, that's a good that's a really good point um so we're gonna go ahead and take our first break we come back we're gonna talk about the beginning of your career with uh search and rescue off you know how you got into it and then how that how you managed to fade that into the actual job so we will be right back don't go anywhere
All right, everybody, we are back. Working Dog Radio broadcasting the bite. Hits Canine Training Conference. This is America's premier canine training seminar packed to the brim with the world's best instructors and me and Eric. All covering important topics. There's no better place to learn and no better place to network with other handlers, breeders, and trainers. Hits 2022 is being held in Orlando, Florida this year, August 16th through the 19th. And I know how you guys are. Everybody waits the last minute. And in the post-Rona world, everybody's training budgets are being cut and everybody's deciding whether they're going to be able to get to go or not. So don't wait because they're not going to have an infinite number of spots and the price goes up after a certain date. So get signed up as soon as possible. It's in Orlando. We'll see you there. Be sure to hit them up. Hits K9, letter K number nine dot net. One of the best relationships we have in this podcast and in this industry is with the great people down at Kinetic Dog Food. The story of Kinetic uh, Performance Dog Food is pretty simple. They wanted to make a better premium dog food for the dogs that need it the most. Their goal is to give every working and sporting dog a higher energy level, better performance, and better overall health through superior nutrition. So they formulated a line of food based on what they considered to be the optimal profile of a performing of performance dog. They've done tons of research on this. This isn't their first rodeo. These guys know what they're doing. If you're a kennel, they will come to your kennel. They will see the problems that you have. They will check out what works for the dogs that you have. Um, they're amazing people to work with. They drop ship a pallet right to you if you want. Um, I know a lot of guys that use them. There's a bunch of different formulas on there. And uh, 32K might not be for your dogs. Maybe the 20 uh, 6K works. They can adjust it. They'll give you the right ideas what to do in different parts of the year. Winter's different than summer. It's uh, it's really a well-run, good dog food um, company, kineticdogfood.com. Be sure to check them out on social media too, man. They're, they're amazing folks, kineticdogfood.com. By now, you've probably all heard my story at least once. I'm usually getting tagged by dogs or hurting myself. So this next product is like near and dear to me because I actually use it. Uh, quick turn by vet care. It does great for keeping small things from turning into big ones. I use it at the kennel for uh, clients, dogs that have some issues with skin stuff or have food allergies or have environmental allergies. It works great. Keeps hot spots from making giant hot spots. And it keeps my working dogs who inevitably find fact, magnificent ways to hurt themselves from turning it into a giant vet visit. It stops little issues from becoming big ones. So it comes in a spray, it comes in an ointment, it comes in a dressing. It's great for creating a protective barrier and promoting wound healing. You really only have to use it like once a day. So there's no reason not to have it in the vehicle. Since it's temperature stable, you don't got to worry about it getting hot, getting cold or anything like that. So put it in your first aid kit or put it in your cabinet. Vetcare.us on the internet. Quick Derm by Vetcare on, the inter on Instagram and on Facebook. And then hit them up with the discount code 10WDR for 10% off your first order. So my entire time that I was a handler or a trainer in law enforcement, the cars at my department in the departments that I trained all had American aluminum accessory kennels in the cars, different cars, man, Dodge chargers, all Ford models, some Chevys, uh, SUVs, cars, everything. We loved American aluminum accessories. Um, it's a great product, a great company. They've been serving uh canine law enforcement community for over 20 years, if you check out their uh, website, EZ, that's the letter Z, EZRiderOnline.com, they got testimonials, they got videos on how to, they got a list of everything they have. Uh, just today, we made a post on the Working Dog Radio social media showing a dog that survived a really bad crash because of the American aluminum kennel in the back of the car. Check them out online, guys, EZRiderOnline.com. Just let them do their thing, man. Whatever car you got for your work, your patrol car, Get a hold of them, American Aluminum Accessories, and get the best in the business. Next up comes uh, training courses online from our friends down at Highland Canine Training, Jason and Aaron Ferguson. So in the post-Rona world, uh, training budgets have been getting cut. People aren't going to be able to travel, whether it be instructors or they be canine handlers and supervisors going somewhere else for training. So Highland has announced a lot of online training courses. One of those that sticks out to me is their police supervisor canine course. And it's no secret that one of the problems with canine tends to be some of the supervision issues. This course is specifically designed for administrators and covers utilization as well as liability and FL FLSA issues. The course can be taken at your convenience and you'll receive a certificate of completion at the end. When you go to tactical police 
K9 training. That's letter K number nine training.com and use the discount code WDR30. You'll get 30% off of that course. With Sonia Nordstrom, podcast hope host, uh, K9 Top Tales. It's a really good uh, podcast to go take a listen to. She's got great guests on there. Um, long time FBI agent, long time dog person, search and rescue, doing stuff for the FBI with the dogs. What I, so you you get your first duty station in West Virginia. You're there for just a little bit. You're, you pop over into Pittsburgh, which I love Pittsburgh. But um, tell us how you, because you said you, all of a sudden, you're like, I got in with the search and rescue people. How, how did that work out? Um, we used to have firearms at a fire training facility. And there was a little agility course over for dogs. And I'm like, huh. And one night we had firearms and there were a whole bunch of dogs and they were these random dogs. They weren't police dogs. So I walked over and it was a search group. So I started training three days a week from that day forward. <laughs> and then um, and then when I moved to LA about a year later, I ended up, I had a fugitive lead and the detective had just gone to detect, had actually just left detectives and gone to canine. So I said, hey, can I come out to canine? So I started training with them. So I was pretty much driving home by braille because I was training about 40 hours a week plus working about 50 hours a week. So it was kind of a crazy, I got the bug and, <laughs> and just kept doing it. And, um, and once I got over to the police canines um, and was working with them, I'm like, okay, I need a dog that's dependable, that isn't, you know, variable. So I got a really nice little German shepherd. And when I got my German shepherd, my police canine training group got two new dogs. So they went to um, full-time training. So I'd hook up with them every night as best I could and kind of got our dogs all kind of came up together in a weird way. So when their dogs, mine was, he was live. And um, when their dogs were finding and biting, my dog was finding and refinding. So it, it worked out. They, they really emphasized hunt a lot in the training group. And I was just really fortunate to land with that group. And it was all just kind of circumstance. Now I have very little interaction with search and rescue people prior to the podcast, to be honest with you. Um, there was nobody right in the Canton, Ohio area. So like if we need a cadaver dog, we called uh, a group that was an uh, hour, hour away, sometimes a little bit further. The one um, I always remember the, uh, the guy that we would call, he was a fire captain or he may be even assistant chief at a fire department. His name is Dave Davis. And I remember that because we had a captain of the police department named Dave Davis. And we called him down a few times for his cadaver dog. But when Ted and I started doing the podcast and we started having search and rescue people on here, and then we started talking to him like pre-recording and then after the recording. And then when we really started seeing how much of their own money, their own time. Oh, it's and, totally. Uh, yeah. And <laughs> everything that these people put in and the dedication that they, uh, they have, which Ted and I say all the time, the, the, the canine guys, the police canine guys, there's no way they're going to work and then train an additional 40 hours. Um, I guess they don't even need to, they're being paid to, to do it when they're on, on duty. So I, we met a bunch, we've had a few people on here, search and rescue people. And so I started opening up the fun house, which is my training facility on the police side. And when they come, the groups come and use the place uh, in the winter because it's freezing cold and it's warm in my place. And we have bathrooms. Um, <laughs> That's a big one. <laughs> right. We don't charge. I don't charge them because I yeah. know they're all, I mean, some of those guys are driving two, three, four hours yeah. to come train at the spot and um, all on their own dime. Yeah. And so I'm always fascinated with that. Um, and to even pay back a little bit more to those folks. Uh, I had Cameron Ford out here for uh, his um, cognition seminar that he does. Yeah, and I super. only, I only opened it to search and rescue people and I made it super cheap. I, I trust me, I lost a ton of money on it, but um, they filled it in two days done filled. Yep. No, it's a definite, it's a passion. Um, and in the way that sport, I mean, people who do sport, they, they do the same thing, right? It's a passion and it's, it's engaging with your dog and it's working toward a goal and, you know, search and rescue is a little bit different mentality. And sometimes the quality is not great, right? There's great intent, but not great quality. Um, but it has gotten better. 
in the, because I started in 95, so what, that's like 27 years ago. It has definitely gotten better. And I think it's gotten better with, with um, as much as I hate social media, there's no excuse to not see that better is out there. Right. When you live in your vacuum, you sort of train with the people you train with and you think that that's the end all. But if you have the availability of the world that you can scroll through and again, you're only seeing the best of what they have to offer. Right. But but there's no excuse to not get better. There's no excuse to not say, wow, that's really great and I can get there. So I think with all of the hyper um, sharing of information, the potential for getting better is great. You know, search and rescue, they're held to standards, but they're not held to competition in the way, like I did French Ring and Mondia Ring and Schutzund a little bit, right, for a few years. And it's a very different ball game. You know, it's, you are held to a standard and there is no cheating that's, not that, you yeah. know, and, and you get points. So you really have to perform. It truly is performance. So my goal in, in moving forward from that was to sort of bring that precision level to the detection world. So that's, so now I only do single purpose. I was doing dual purpose. Now I only do single purpose detection. Cadaver is my personal thing. And then I teach other detection dogs, but, and I teach nose work, you know, for pets. But, um, but I think, I think for me, if I could see better, I could do better. And so that's, you know, and that's why I, I kept seeking out good training and I kept seeking out the performance training and the performance trainers. Um, because there is this, this thing like, oh, I just go walk around the woods with my dog and then I sort of see the person and I cue the dog, you know, there's that that goes on. But then there's that dog that's actively hunting and actively working and independently responding. And, but our searches are, it, it's, it's not an easy, it's not easy. And, and you have to have an alignment of stars to have success on some level. But. Ted, talk, tell, talk about what you always mention about the FEMA certification. We, oh, we had old fuck. boy on. <laughs> yeah. So my hand, I got a guy right now getting ready to, we're getting in prep for now, or, uh, USPCA. And, uh, and then I've got some, I had another handler up here from an Oklahoma County Sheriff's office. And, uh, we're talking about cleat, which is our post thing. Um, which the, the, then we have a detection standard only and we don't have any patrol or tracking or anything. So we were talking about standards and obedience and all this other stuff. And I always remind these guys how much harder it is for FEMA handlers. And mm -hmm. I like, uh, the Tulsa task force handlers, um, uh, Jeff Leon and, uh, Shelby, um, are friends of mine um, and they just got their like fucking some random ass not random but some crazy thing I think her and Jeff just both got their uh, like Woodland 47 I don't know it sounds like a video game like their certification standard I'm like what is this and yeah. but the dogs have I don't know I mean Shelby runs a black or a black lab and then I think Jeff has a lab also um, but like the amount of time that goes into those FEMA certifications is absolutely ridiculous. I mean, we're talking, I mean, Eric, what's it takes to run an OPATA certification? Like 35 minutes. Um, no, it takes longer than that, but, uh, by, by lunch, we've done like 10 things. So, right. I mean, so to get certified, no, with it's, FEMA, it's, it's like three years. <laughs> like, I don't know what the length is, but like your dog is halfway through his career by the time he's already done and certified. I'm like, God bless. But before we're recording, Sonia and I were talking about um, like the mission standards and like you're talking about right now are much, much, much different than they are uh, for, you know, even narcotics detection. Narcotics, and I say this and I tell my guys this, I'm like, you know, the actual nuts and bolts of running the dog it's pretty straightforward. I mean, they're out for like five, 10 minutes, you know, running the vehicle, like hopefully not 10 minutes because then you got a Rodriguez problem or you can, mm -hmm. but anyway, like that doesn't take long. And where we run into problems is our fourth amendment stuff, right? It's like what you say, why you're there, what you found, how you found it, how you came about it. And like all the things that come into it, it's not the actual dog with this search and rescue stuff. Like it's literally, it, it is, it's about the damn dog. So the standards and the mission profiles are, ridiculously different and i don't honestly i don't know a ton about it i don't know a ton about the case law either even though i know a lot about the other stuff but i mean 
talk a little bit about uh, those differences, like with the FEMA stuff and because we've had search and rescue handlers on before. And I think we've gotten to the point where we've just said, it's just hard <laughs> like, <laughs> it's, and it's involved. Yeah, it's well, just to give an example, my first quote mission ready test, right? That's what in, in the wilderness SAR search and rescue environment, my first official mission ready test was 160 acres and you have four hours and you have to find three people. That's when you knew how many people. Now they've made it 120 acres. And it's not like a flat field. We're talking mountains and deadfall and you know, you, you've got to work the topography, you've got to work the terrain, you've got to know how the wind is blowing, it's going to change in the middle, it, you know, you've got to use your GPS. So you've got to have all these skills of navigation. And when I was doing it, we didn't even have GPSs. So now it's like, to me, it's super simple. It's like an etch-a-sketch. The dog just draws on your GPS and you know where he's been. And he kind of goes where you go. But back when I had an old lady that I am had an actual map and a compass and I had to find my corners and I had to sort of figure out that my dog had gotten appropriate coverage and that I had a certain grid width and all these different things. Now I'm just like, oh, I got a hole on my GPS. I'll go over there, you know? So it's, it's easier with technology, but you still have to do it. And it still is pretty intimidating. Um, and then the dog has to give the, the response. So it does take a long time. And the other big thing why you, you know, you get a police dog, it's already, it's pre-trained to some degrees, even if it's a green dog, it's been cultivated. Um, and then you get it and then you go through your school. Well, we're typically starting with puppies and then you're emotionally invested in it and then you're waiting for it to develop. And so it is sort of, you can't even test the dog until he's 18 months for some of the standards. Mm -hmm. So it's a very long road because you're, I mean, I'm starting, I, I, we have a new person on the team, you know, she's an experienced person, but she just got a new dog. I started her eight week old puppy on cadaver and I've already got him indicating it's the cutest thing you've ever seen. Um, and again, I don't want to focus on that. I'd rather focus on, but we're doing all these little runaways with eight week and nine week old puppies and trying to develop this and keeping it happy and then working the obedience and the exposure and different buildings. So a lot of that stuff is done kind of for you in Europe, right? They've, they've had the dogs hunting in all these environments, potentially, if you're getting a good selected dog. So we're sort of starting at ground zero. So I find, I feel really confident about my ability to work a puppy up from nothing, right? And to cater to what it needs at a given time um, and to know what it ultimately has to do. So another thing that comes up is I, I, was, I was telling Ted, um, I went on a search last year. My dog did 22 miles in the day. Jesus. I did about 12. He did 22. I mean, so it's such a broad and, and often I'm up in these crazy mountains. We get dropped by helicopter and I'm up at 10, 12, 14,000, well, 12,000 feet. And what we'll often do is we'll each pick um, a topo line and I'll say, okay, I'm going at 9,400 feet and I'll meet you at the next lake. And we just kind of traverse across and then they'll pick the 9,200 line. And then we'll kind of just hope that we have updrafts. So the strategy, understanding how odor works, um, that's a big, big part of it. And people, you know, it's, it's more than the dog. Like the person has to be, they have to get it. Like some people are technically challenged. They don't know how to turn a GPS on. And, and it's, a, so there, there's, it's kind of more than the dog, but the dog has to do it, you know? So it, it can be challenging for sure. Search and rescue people are oftentimes the SWAT dudes of that world because they have all the kit, all the <laughs> stuff. Oh, yeah. All I, I've seen guys, I'm like, he's pulling this thing out and this thing out and all these on these lanyards. And I'm like, what? He, I, you got $10,000 of shit on your vest. <laughs> um, so when you started and you, so you meet these people and you start and you jump right into it and you're trained. So here's something that, um, and Ted and I kind of talk about this a lot about, uh, you know, genetics and the right dog and things, but as a human up to this point, if you personally put enough hours in whatever it is you're working on, you're going to get better. So in the FBI Academy, you put enough time on the range, your shooting's getting better. Your PTs get, everything's getting better, 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 better. With that first dog, before you got the shepherd, what, at what point did you have to say, fuck, it, 
this isn't well it. It, it well it was really kind of cute it was funny she okay so the first team i trained with i couldn't have been luckier that guy it was a husband and wife they were both professional trainers he was a longtime Schutzen 3FH guy. He had very powerful shepherds, and the local PD would call him out to look for fugitives. He was awesome. Bob Sarver, love it. To this day, stuff he said, I absolutely am like, he was right, he was right, he was right. So it wasn't just like the being enamored by somebody who has a dog that can do something. He actually, I live by his words still. Mm -hmm. And his wife, Marge, had auches on a bunch of border collies. So the two of them, so that was our little training group, and they were fabulous. And my little dog was, would be like brilliant. And then she'd be like, yeah, I don't want to. And I, and I remember leaving Pittsburgh thinking, oh my God, this is great. There won't be deer everywhere. <laughs> and then I got to California and there were lizards everywhere. And she's like, I'm going to chase lizards. So anyway, so when I went to the first police training, I remember it was kind of funny. So the guy's in a suit and I've got this cute little fluffy collie looking thing. And she's adorable. And I sent her out on this guy in a bite suit. And I'm thinking, well, she's never seen a guy. And she sat like a princess and woof, 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 woof. And he goes, well, what's wrong with that? And I said, give her a day. And then she wouldn't find them again. And then, you know, so she would or she wouldn't. And, and I just, and then I saw what their dogs did and that pounding, like I'm going, I'm going, I'm going. And the idea of their dogs ever walking somebody was just impossible, right? These were great dogs. And in my search and rescue, I saw dogs that would walk people. So I was like, okay, we, you know, and I'm like, okay, I'm not going to tolerate that. So that's when I, I, I just was like, no, I, I have to. If the stars had aligned, she could. And I often say what someone can do and what they should do are not the same. And it's not right to take a resource into the field and not know with certainty that they will do their job. So I got a really nice seven-month-old shepherd and then, you know, and again, when you start with seven months, it takes a long time. So, but he certified pretty quick. Um, and because I was a full court press lunatic with good people. Um, so, and I often say, okay, so I'm six feet tall. I'm a Viking. I'm huge. I don't care if I study ballet with Barishnikov. I will never, ever <laughs> be a good ballerina. So training alone will not do it. And I'm sure you guys have seen this people tend to create the same dog over and over and over again. Right. Oh yeah. T or Ted try mentioned or, that about a lot of people or, or try right. and recreate. I call it the go Well, like the third episode we ever had, we named it the ghost of Duco too, because we had subtle on. Right. And like that people have, had, there's been more Duco two dogs work in this country than I think were ever fucking born. And <laughs> like, Everyone's like, oh, he's a Duco too. I'm like, that motherfucker's been dead since Clinton was in office. Like, what do you know that I don't? And so, yeah, believe me, like people are either trying to recreate their, well, they're either creating the same dog over and over again, or they're trying to recreate another dog. And yeah, but, but what I mean is if somebody isn't talented, oh, they yeah. never talented. So the people that have sort of that lukewarm dog, you'll get another dog and they'll have another lukewarm dog. I think it goes to their personality type, like yeah. people that Bazzy, they're gonna have to... so people tend to kind of you know there's the one dog wonder right where you just happen to get that dog and it's like wow you were lucky um yeah. but generally people tend to and then hopefully they get a little bit better each time but but there are some people that really shouldn't be dog handlers maybe no um, and you know they're just I don't know. And it has nothing to do with how much they love it. It has nothing to do with how much they try in the way that I should never be a ballerina. <laughs> I just I mean, I, I, I say I... this all the time <laughs> because Eric and I, Eric and I have this, well, not just Eric and I exclusively, but anyone that does what Eric and I do, where we train police dogs, we get this all the time. People are like, this dog should be a police dog. I'm like, why? He's like, oh, he's a German shepherd. I'm like, okay. You know, how many people do you know that played basketball in high school? And they're like, oh, a lot. I mean, how many people made it to the NBA? Right. And they kind of look at me like that number is finite. Like we know that number to the actual number, like a whole round number. Yes. And we know every single one of those, like we have a long data history on every single one of those players. And those are kind of the odds that we're looking at. And I say the same thing, like no matter how, like I'm six feet tall, but no matter how much I train, like I can't overcome genetics. I'll never play in the NBA. It's just not going to happen. Right. So, and to a lot of people's credit, like, you know, with the departments that we deal with, a lot of times we're kind of like stuck with the dog that we get. Or they are, right? So we're dealing with what we have. So a long time ago, and people say this all the time, and I don't think they 
like grasp what I'm saying with they when or not necessarily me when somebody tells me this we say you know train the dog in front of you right I'm constantly yelling at my trainers my pet trainers and I'm like train the damn dog in front of you it's not a blueprint for this and um, I know some magnificent sport trainers and some magnificent police dog trainers that know what they're really good at and they select dogs that play to those strengths and they end up like what you said like with really really nice dogs but they're like blueprints right and they're but they'll full-on tell you like i need the dog to be balanced more this way or that way or like whatever and and this is i think where eric and i run into this a lot where they're like oh we only want a shepherd because malinois are crazy i'm like yep. man you ain't seen some shepherds then because i've seen some that are way worse than malinois and i think that's what it comes from because you know i've seen dudes that have handled two and three and four shepherds and they get a malinois and they hand them like yo can't handle this dog like that like you mess with him like it was like you correct him he's gonna correct you back like you yeah. like let's hold on a second and inevitably it ends up happening where they're like oh it's a dog problem i'm like well but is no. it <laughs> is no. it really though yeah. so yes that we run it, into that a lot yeah it's interesting and and so my my first shepherd he was he's the one that went to the pentagon with me and he was so so how i integrated him into the fbi so what ended up happening was I certified him as a volunteer all on my own. But the reality is, is that the volunteer is who law enforcement's calling. There were no professional dog handlers in the area that could do a cadaver search, that could do a live search. So I basically went to the FBI evidence response team because I was kind of part of it. And I said, look, you're calling volunteers who have no law enforcement knowledge. I mean, not some of them, of course, do. And, and they really study hard and everything. But I'm just saying, you're calling in civilians to a homicide when you have someone who has specialized training in evidence collection, who understands things, so why not use me? So that's kind of how it got going. And then the Bureau you know, would send me on searches. So I went on various searches and, and then they got me a car for the dog. And so it just kind of evolved from there, but it was always my dog. But um, about a year after the Pentagon, I took Nico on a search and he jumped out of a parking garage, fell to his death and it was horrifying. And um, this is why Steve Stoops and I are, you know, bonded forever friends. He gave me his Dutch Shepherd puppy. Oh, geez. Yeah. He, get, he says, I'm giving you my dog. And, and this is before Facebook and everything. And I wrote my friends and said, I lost Nico. It's devastating. And he said, I'm giving you my puppy. So I got this seven month old Zane Stoops raised puppy, which was a lunatic who at four mm -hmm. months was released to hit a, hit a, hit a suit. <laughs> <laughs> so and Kenny was pissed he was like you got everybody wanted him because he was kind of great you know he was a lunatic and Steve had him in the patrol cart seven weeks and bopping him around and exposing him to everything and making him want to kill everyone and and that became my sar dog <laughs> so and Excellent. then I on the duchies so I've just had four duchies since that one and he taught me that I don't have to be the cheerleader all I have to do is be the calm and it's a yeah. very different different kind of thing and i love it and but when you talk about selection last dog i got i got him from holland at 14 months because i didn't want the risk of a nerve bag or things that are genetically impossible to overcome or that i spend all my training time trying to overcome things that i don't really want to have to overcome so i opted for as much as i love to train puppies and now that I'm sort of old, the next one I get will be a baby puppy because if I don't make it, I'll be ready to retire. So it won't matter. But this one matters because I'm still doing this. So that's kind of how I looked at it. That's a, that's a good way to take it. Uh, we're going to go ahead and take our second break. Uh, don't fast forward to the commercials. The discount codes are in the show notes. We say this every time, but I skip through them. So I know that you do too. So, uh, when we come back, we're gonna Fuck. we're gonna come back and we're gonna talk about um, handling those dogs in the FBI and um, and uh, see if we can't get some juicy stuff from you when we get back. So <laughs> stick around. Yes. All right. We love the Perkinsons down in uh, North Carolina at Highland Canine Training. They are great people, great trainers. They got a good business model. They're awesome folks. We've been with them for a long time. Uh, they're also super smart and they understand that a lot of agencies are struggling to have manpower. So they're not sending people away for training. You guys have been there, you know, you put in denied lack of manpower. So they've created an online course 
section of their website, tactical police canine training.com. You get on there under training the online course, but here's the best thing is they offer a supervisor canine supervisor course, which we know a lot of uh, police canine supervisors don't get to go to training. They don't know as much as they should right here online. Uh, the course discusses topics such as proper selection of dogs and handlers, proper deployment, effective allocation and utilization, as well as liability and the FLSA issues, which we know is where all the legal stuff comes from, interdepartmental. Uh, the course can be taken at your convenience, and you, you will receive a certificate of completion at the end. Uh, they're offering an amazing discount, guys. 30% off using the discount code WDR30. It's a no-brainer. If you're a police supervisor and you guys have manpower issues and you can't go, get on tacticalpolicecaninetraining.com under the training tab. Get on that supervisor's course, man. I'm telling you, it's a smart decision. Another one of our favorite partnerships with the podcast here is the one and only Dogtra. The Dogtra guys have been producing some amazing tools in the dog training world for a long time. Everything from e-collars, GPS tracking, ball trainers. If it's electric, and you use it with a dog, they've probably done it. They're the best. They are revolutionizing the way you communicate with the dog. I use it daily, whether I'm using pets. Uh, I use the 200C on most of our pets. Uh, most of my patrol guys will use a 1900 hands-free, 1900S hands-free. And then I use the ball popper pretty much daily with all of our detection dogs for imprinting on our box protocols. So hit them up at Dogtra Official on Instagram and Facebook. And then you've got Dogtra.com. And when you go there, if you use the discount code WDR10, they give you 10% off a single item over 200 bucks. So if you're looking at a 1900S or that Ball Popper Pro or one of those things, it'll knock a substantial chunk off there. So hit them up, doctor.com, WDR10. So everybody knows that Ted and I uh, not only train police dogs, we train pet dogs, right? We train dogs. So it's why our relationship with Ray Allen manufacturing is so important. They've, these guys have been doing this so long. They knew and they understand that dogs are dogs and it's not just working dog people that need things for their dog and dog training. So you go to rayallen.com. They have everything dog related that you need. Anything that when it comes to dogs, pet dogs, your pet training dogs, police dogs, dogs you're training for other departments, anything you need, rayallen.com. Uh, they've got it. You can get on there. So if you're ordering stuff for police dogs and if you have a pet side, you can get it all in one, man. They ship it out. Got a nice big box full of a whole bunch of stuff. There's nothing better than getting a big box of dog training stuff in the mail. They also are great to us and they offer a discount code working dog radio, all capital letters, working dog radio for 10% off. Check them out. RayAllen.com. Great people. Ted and I use them every day. Super excited to have American Aluminum Accessories on board with us here at the podcast. These guys manufacture a wide variety of products from high quality cam locker toolboxes to an extensive line of products designed to meet the ever-changing needs of law the law enforcement community. Around 1992, due to the demand for safe and secure transport for a local law enforcement agency's canine unit, they introduced the very first in-vehicle Easy Rider canine container. So it was basically what we now call just our inserts. They have continuously grown and expanded uh, the products, catering to the needs and the wants of their valued customers and high-profile clientele, and catering specifically to law enforcement. Over the years, as the needs have changed for law enforcement, they've evolved and expanded the products to include inmate transport systems, the canine training aids, which I use quite a bit of, canine inserts, most of, every one of my guys has one of those things. And you know, you, if you're not even have to be in law enforcement, I have several friends that are civilians that work lots of dogs that have the inserts put into their cars too so you got one that fits you can do it uh they also do contraband and animal control systems just to name a few so be sure to hit them up the website is easy rider online so that's the letter e the letter z as in zebra rideronline.com. if you're looking for them on instagram and facebook it's american aluminum accessories feel free to hit them up there too so our first and oldest sponsor that's been with us from the beginning is arno out out at ALM, uh, out there in, in Las Vegas area. Arno is a great dude. He makes great stuff for, for police work and sport work, suits, tugs. I'm telling you right now, his tugs are the best in the business. You can't get any better. Multiple colors. Uh, I, I buy boxes of them from him and give them out to everybody. Uh, I've got a bite suit from him. Love it. I've had it for a little over three years, and it's holding up like a champ. Um, Ted's got a 
suit that he's had forever from ALM. Uh, we wouldn't go anywhere else, man. We love it. Arno is such a good dude. His uh, ALM K9 equipment.com is the website. Get on there. He's got pre-made suits. He can do custom suits based on your measurements. Um, he's got stuff already, already made up. If you kind of get a kind of generic large size, maybe for everybody, the colors he has, man, is really cool. He can put a lot of stuff on those suits. Uh, check them out. ALM K9 equipment.com and use the discount code WD radio for 10% off. You know, running a kennel is one of those things that I always worry about is cleanliness and safety of dogs. And it's, it seems like it's an ever changing issue being able to house dogs and move things around and everything else. So the guys at horizon structure make this as easy as possible. Literally the only thing you have to do is have water and power hookups and they deliver it and you can put dogs in that day. And it comes built, comes on a trailer. They just drop it off. You plug it in, put dogs in it, and you're ready to rock. You keep them clean. You keep them safe. You keep them cool in the summer and warm in the wintertime. And it's completely custom. You can go complete mild to wild. I've seen some that were stainless steel all the way from top to bottom on the inside. And then I've seen some for a, a bulldog breeder that, you know, had smaller gates because those things can't jump. So if you reach out to them, uh, they're sitting there waiting for you to call and help you through the custom design process. They have everything from two dog ones up to, uh, I want to say like 18 or 20. It's a lot of, you can put a lot of dogs, indoor, outdoor runs. So anything you've ever dreamed of, they've got it, or have done it or can do it. So they've taken all the guesswork out of building it. Everything is pre-done to your specifications and it's assembled, dropped off, boom, you're ready to rock. These things are amazing. Uh, Rigney has one. Uh, we've had him on the show a couple of times. Go check out his Instagram and you can see he's posted it up there before. Go look Horizon up at Horizon Structures, spelled out uh, on the internet. It's horizonstructures.com. And you're going to look for the link in there that says commercial dog kennels. Or give them a call, 888-447-4337. They'd love to talk to you and get you started on the way. All right, everybody, we are back. Working Dog Radio broadcasting the bite with Sonia Nordstrom. Canine Top Tales uh, on all the platforms, I assume, all the podcast platforms. I think so. Yep, good. Um, I just listened to it on iTunes. It's easy peasy piece of cake. So um, right before the break, you talked about how you bridged the gap from search and rescue getting into the FBI. I was wondering about that because when I first uh, read your bio on the on the podcast, I was like, I've – I've been around the FBI a lot for years. I've never even heard that, that they ever had a dog, never heard of it. <clears throat> so um, you kind of opened that door. There were Here six. I am. Of, yeah. There were six of us across the country when I was doing it. And, um, and one of the guy, he was wonderful, Fernando Fernandez. And he was down in Miami. So there was like, he was in Miami. There was gal in Texas. We were just kind of spread out. So it was sort of up to the division. It wasn't a, it wasn't a national program or anything. So it's kind of like, okay, and here's the bottom line. The FBI hires people that come in with skills. They don't hire kids out of high school or college, right? They hire people that already have skills. So like we had, we had a surgeon that was, <laughs> he was our tactical medic trainer, you know? So the way to look at it is use the skills of the people that you have. So that was the skill that I sort of brought to the table and then they would use me and then they would start sending me on different cases and, and I'd just go. And, and so what'll happen in, in a, in a kidnap investigation and, you know, predominantly we're looking for someone who's probably not alive in a kidnapping, you have a command post, you have a tip line and people are calling in, calling in, calling in with all the leads. Well, those leads are run out to the end by the investigative staff. Some of those leads are best worked by a dog. Like I saw birds over this field, send a dog. I saw somebody digging in their backyard, send a dog. So that was kind of the first case that that sort of worked. I went up as a volunteer on a weekend, believe it or not, on the Yosemite murders. Do you remember that one? Mm -hmm. oh, the yeah. mother daughter, it was the yeah. end, like in 98, I guess. And I went up as a It was a the maintenance guy, right? Wasn't yeah, it the it maintenance very guy? Yeah. Very yeah. Stable. And he had forced into the room so I went up and then I was there on the weekend as a volunteer but they let me take my view car I said hey, you're okay so I'm going up to Sacramento from LA and then I was up there and I said you know if you want me to hang out I'll run leads and if you have a dog lead I'll be here well that's how I found Julie it was on the fourth day 
and I just ran a lead. So I was out doing interviews. I was doing door knocks. I was running down normal leads. And it was like lead number 2,400 something that seemed completely not right. And it was 50 miles away. And I'm like, well, I'll hit it in the afternoon. You'll have off drafts. And in five minutes, we had her. Wow. And so i had been there looking and Dang. didn't. So they had, somebody had already scoped the lead mm-hmm. and not found her. So the dog is, so, so then it, it's sort of, you know, it has value, right? I, I've done several searches where, where the dog has found it, where people haven't. And, and that happens. That's why you use a different tool, but it's not magic by any means, as we all know, but there are circumstances under which a dog will have success where a person won't. So I'm not going to lie. I wish I would not mind if my name was Fernando Fernandez. Yeah. He's that's, the that's, greatest. He's the greatest. That's a pretty sweet <laughs> ass name. <laughs> He, he worked, he worked mouths before other people. He was very involved. I think it was with USPCA down in Miami. He was, he worked a drug dog and then he and I, so there were six of us that worked at the Pentagon that were pulled in from across the country um, Mm -hmm. who were sort of doing it the way I was doing it. We were all kind of independent. And then the program kind of formalized and it lasted sort of for an iteration. HRT has dogs and they have been very successful, but they tried a few iterations before they were successful. Um, and then, of course, you know, the, the FBI police that police around the building have bomb dogs. But um, and then individuals in the, like I remember in Philly, there was a guy who worked a cadaver dog and then, you know, L.A. had a bomb dog. So randomly, the divisions will maybe support a, a dog within the division. I am an idiot because here I'm working crimes against children forever and never thought of the whole cyber detection dog thing i'm like yeah. why and i think of that i was doing those warrants constantly so i was a little bit mad at myself for not thinking of that so when there was just six of you did you feel <clears throat> did you feel pressure uh either real or imaginary uh to prove the the model oh constantly yeah of course and i screwed up I mean, I absolutely have screw ups. And, and as I, I was saying it to, to Ted, when you're working cadaver dog, um, there's, you know, detection is detection, right? And imprinting is imprinting and odor, it's odor response done, right? Nice independent hunt, nice independent response. But with cadaver, and I've started to even say this every time I go out, I cannot simulate duration in the field, set time. I cannot simulate volume. So today I go on a search for somebody who's been missing for three days up at 10,000 feet and I'm going to cover miles. Tomorrow I'm looking for maybe a 30 year old burial in somebody's backyard that's completely trashed, right? So there's not a dial and I can't simulate a burial for 30 years. I maybe can go work a pioneer grave here and there and give the dog the idea, but I can't simulate in training what I'm asking the dog to do in the field. And that's what makes it very difficult and then you've got the odor dispersion is insanity because it it, and in altitude it screams i don't know if you've ever worked a dog in altitude Mm -hmm. but they get odor from like a mile away um because there's the air so thin it just travels and and so at night it's draining and in the morning it's going so you can't even follow you know you'll get it down below and you say well it must be up above well it might have come from someplace else and it can go over a mountain so it's it's um counterintuitive because every pet dog goes and finds something that stinks and rolls in it right <laughs> but but when you're sending the dog out to actually cover an area and look for it and ignore all the animal remains and ignore all the stuff um it, it's really it's so frustrating that we can't adequately train for it so all you can do is just keep throwing them out there throwing them out there throwing them out there and then there's these seminars and schools where you can go and get that full body experience but you're not doing it even then you're not really doing it in a uncontrolled environment right where it's simulating what you'd be finding so the variability is beyond huge so <clears throat> it's something weird um sorry i just cleared my throat in everyone's ears but um <laughs> when when i went through class with my first police dog which was 05 um week nine we went as a class to dc for a trip the original trainer for canton police department K9 was um a guy named Dave Haskins. He was a DC Metro uh, handler trainer. Back then, I think they had like a hundred dogs. And um, so what they used to do is go down there and hang out right along with the canine guys and all that stuff. What we did was drink um, and just party. 
So we did, I never even met a single DC handler while we were down there. But on a Saturday or Sunday, we went to the Pentagon. The one handler, Mike, who's still a dog handler, uh, after 9-11, he was in a Michigan National Guard, I think, and then he was stationed at the Pentagon. And so we just went into the parking lot of the Pentagon. His job there was walker while he was there was he was walking around and he would check, do security checks on like Rumsfeld's office and other guys' offices and stuff. And the the Pentagon policeman who comes out to greet us in the parking lot, like, who the hell are you? What are you doing here on a Saturday? And um, was a bloodhound trainer. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. And he had... So on the, I think it was maybe on the USPCA website, one of them, they had a, um, an article on the front page for like two or three years about reading the negatives in your dog, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, he wrote that. And that thing was on there for forever. But it was pretty cool listening to him talk about, and I, at that time, you know, I was a green handler. I, I didn't know shit. But listening to him talk about all the stuff he'd been doing outside of there he didn't do it for the pentagon obviously yeah um getting to do that it, it was a it, i always remember that it was pretty cool. i still have the article i i pulled it up and and i've given it to handlers and stuff in the past yeah i went through vlk's detection trainer school with mm -hmm. isaac Ho'opi. i don't know if you heard about isaac mm -mm. i would remember I, that name isaac Ho'opi. he's a huge hawaiian <laughs> and he physically carried 17 people out of the pentagon he was a wow. bomb doctor. Pentagon, and he is a hero beyond belief. Um, so he he rolled in and just went in and out, in and out, in and out, and pried people off his arm, getting people out of there. So he's amazing. That's crazy. Now, Ted, so we, Ted and I talk about this a, a bunch. It's hard to break into um, in with the law enforcement people as a civilian. I mean, you have you had a little bit of a a leg in because you know being in law enforcement yourself with your search and rescue dog uh i i find that it's starting to change a little bit ted i don't know about over in oklahoma if if you've bridged that gap over there where they're like ready to actually call a civilian in to help uh yeah there's been times where we've had um stuff happen here in fact uh we had a so oklahoma is kind of unique um because we have a lot of uh tribal nations here mm -hmm. and um there is a I, I don't know the way to tactfully say this indian reservations are like their own country um there's a lot of stuff that happens out there that is uh <laughs> stuff that happens on the res stays on the res it, it's definitely strange um but after the mcgirt decision we had some weird um stuff happen here in the united in in oklahoma um, and they've been solving or starting to prosecute a lot of um, unsolved murders and like re-prosecuting some things. And they actually found a dude that had been missing. Uh, his last name was still smoking, which is kind of ironic because they use a cadaver dog to find him. Uh, but the news came out the other day. I think it was like month. It was like last Thursday or something. They found this dude. He'd been missing for three or four years. And this is the fucked up thing. So. Uh, longer than that, like five years ago, um, they found his car. It was on private property. And because it's Indian, like, you know, they were like, nah, you get out of here. Like whole thing. Right. So they found the dude's body a hundred yards from the car. Mm. That's how long it had been. And they had to use a damn dog to find him and he wasn't buried. And so, and it wasn't like it was a, like an ultra remote area. I mean, it was a dirt road, but it wasn't like, you know, and so but it's interesting um yeah it's so here they do use and the dog that found him uh, i think it was a civilian they put a picture of it up on the news and it was like a pit bull looking thing um so or i don't know what it was i'm gonna get some hate mail i'm sure somebody's gonna mm. reach out and be like fuck you it was so uh but it was definitely not a traditional like floppy or pointy or dog but yeah i mean it was a uh it was it's interesting here because we'll get calls too um, from prosecutors' offices or from sheriff's offices, like investigators, and they're like, "Do you guys have the ability to do cadaver?" I'm like, "Eh, no." I mean, and I'm like, "Why?" And they were like, "Well, 
you know, we're following up on some leads. And so I always have to have a conversation. And we talked about this a little bit. I don't know if we talked about it on camera, but we talked about it, you know, and with narcotics work, you know, we're constantly worried about um, messing with somebody's Fourth Amendment rights. Like, obviously, nobody wants to, you know, nobody wants to, to set precedent in, in case law. And obviously, we also don't want um, bad work to like discredit our work. So, <clears throat> Like I'm real hesitant to like wade into those into that territory, but most of them here are the OSBI has I think one dog or two, uh, and the rest of them are all um, either first or firefighters uh, that run a dead dog um, or uh, civilian. But yeah, we have some civilian groups that are kind of semi local that I don't train with them at all. Um, I've have a couple times, but I mean, yeah, it's mainly civilian. One of the things that could make it better is bottom line is the consumer police, um, because most of the legitimate search and rescue will only respond at the request of law enforcement. Um, if law enforcement took interest in their ability, it would make it better, right? It, you know, we get called and very often it's kind of to check a box. I mean, yes, the dogs are sometimes helpful and <laughs> most often, I mean, you don't get fine. You don't get a lot of fines. You just don't. It's just not that you're you're put out in the middle of the mountain, and it's nowhere near you. So, um, but if law enforcement wanted a better product, they would actually, you know, meet with them a little bit and say, okay, well, what do you have? What is your product? Do I even want you at my crime scene? And then beyond the dog, they really need to look at the handlers. Uh, do you keep a logbook? Can you testify? Can you write a report? Are you going to sit there and screw up my case? Right. So sometimes all it's so there has to be this balance with handler and dog and capability and and people like I said, people are much better at it because there's a lot because we've had some bad case law. Right. Um, yeah. And we've had people like I don't know if you've heard the word Sandy Anderson, who was planting stuff at crime scenes. Yeah. And Hero. so we've had these that's what happen. i was alluding to with <laughs> bad work shadowing good work <laughs> i didn't want to mention it but says her dog was great her, but yeah was yeah good. yeah it was yeah you know. he was finding pre-placed fines like a fucking go. squirrel burying nuts except yeah. bodies weren't <laughs> growing um so you know I, th we ask all handlers this whether military or law enforcement or whatever um and I, I think your answer is going to be pretty interesting, which is why I wanted to ask this question. Um, it was, is there a specific case that stands out to you? that's like, you mentioned the one, um, the Yosemite thing, but is there another one where you like had the dog not, Oh yeah. Had you not had I access could... to the tool that it would have gone unsolved or it would have gone. Unrecovered. Like, for sure. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, so give us a good one. Uh, okay, this one, you're, gonna, you're not going to believe me. You're going to say she's full of it, but I'm going to tell you what happened. Um, and I'm not going to tell you where. Um, it was a potential suicide. The guy's motorcycle is found down and it's Thanksgiving weekend. Um, things are like in the 20s at night and he's been missing, you know, four or five days. Search and rescue ground pounders are everywhere, dogs, whatever. And we're there and conditions are kind of good. You know, it's like maybe in the forties and I'm thinking, but I don't know, he's freezing overnight. It's a fresh dead. I don't know. I don't even know what condition the body's in. Right. So, and there's gates up the road that are closed and locked for the season to lock out campgrounds. And so they sent us up on this particular trail that was like way outside of the area and we're going and there's a downdraft, which you wouldn't think there would be at that time of day. And my dog takes off. I mean, he takes off. He's got a little bell and I can't hear the bell. And then I'm like, oh God, he's gone, right? And, and my GPS isn't working because of the tree cover. So I call him, he comes back and he has what I used to refer to as look of panic. And look of panic is like, oh my God, you gotta come with me. And I'm like, uh, I kinda can't. And there's snow on the ground and he's flipping out. And I've never seen this change of behavior in him so dramatically but I remembered it from three dogs earlier, right? So I'm like, oh, okay, this is not nothing. So we try to find a little trail and it's treacherous, you know, whatever. We go up about a mile or two, he loses interest. And then we come back down and the wind's all different, but I get down and I look at my GPS and I look at the terrain and I look at the map and I'm like, I gotta get up there. 
so I said, so I called the sergeant and he says, we're calling the search. The guy has faked his death before. We don't think he's even here. So we're done. And I said, mm, can I get some dogs to go up on Sunday? You know, so I get him to unlock the gates for us. We start at the campground. I said, I want to take these three drainages. We found him. He was a mile up from where my dog took off. So my wow. dog at a mile. Damn. And then it was winter and it snowed and he would have been under snow. So I don't think he would have been found. And it wasn't a clean, it wasn't like they just nailed him. He was seven tenths of a mile below the campground. And he was a mile up from the trail that we were hitting him from. And we didn't hit him on the way down. And the guy's like, well, he's not doing anything now. And I said, winds are totally different. So that's what I mean by luck. You know, because if I had hit it an hour later, he wasn't going to get. So those are things that clearly without the dog, we wouldn't have gotten it. And then I had a really fun one with my crazy drago dog from Zane um, out in the middle of the desert, 40 acres of desert guys have been it was these two kids from israel who got murdered um and basically somewhere between la and las vegas so somehow <laughs> um, it's like a hunter s thompson book what the yeah, hell yeah so somehow um you know through investigation and whatever 10 months after the fact we end up sort of at this weird you know campground that's that's got like a high wall and it's got a train trellis it's about 30 acres of desert and of course the anthropologists are like, well, we need to probe and look for anomalies. And I'm like, the entire desert is an anomaly if you have not spent time among tumbleweed in the desert, right? So we go and the dog, it, he has a stare and he is running like a lunatic. And he was a lunatic, he was young and we didn't have any fines. So I didn't really know what he was gonna do. And he's literally locking on the desert wall. And I'm like, dogs do not randomly lock. And I'm like, God, there's odor here, right? So I'm sorry, and it's like, you know, and then he's kind of locking various places, but he's not finding anything. And then it gets to be hundred degrees. So I'm like, well, he can't work anymore. So I put him in the car, we're probing and looking for things. I convinced them all to come back at six in the morning. We stay overnight in this godforsaken place. We come back at six when it's like 50 something degrees. And I'm like, I want to go far because maybe he marched him out and shot him out there before they did something. We didn't know if he was buried or whatever. And, you know, and dog, got it got a grave they were four feet down Damn. so you know because the condition this is what i mean so everything like conditions everything had settled it was cool and basically i'm just kind of going and i'm like well and, and i i found an anomaly i said the dog's not doing it and they're all standing in the parking lot because like oh she's just gonna go screw around with her dog she didn't know anything right so they're all standing there and i'm like uh oh, on the next tell way back when i said there's an anomaly out here and i the dog doesn't care about it, but you might want to check it out. So they run out there with shovels and they do whatever. And then I work my way back and then, and the dog, I'm sorry, I'm screaming at him. He's running rabbits. I'm like, oh my God. And then total change of behavior. And he goes over to this thing and I'm looking and he, I go to move a brand and he starts biting at it and he's just kind of lighting up. And I'm like, ah, oh, you guys. And sure enough, there they were. So again, would not have been found without the dog right. unless the bad guy brought them to them. So I have a few like that, you know, or where they search for five days and my dog found them in two hours or where everybody's, I mean, I've got a bunch like that. I don't have a bunch of fines because we don't get a bunch of fines, but I can name off kind of a bunch of those where without the dog, they had been walked numerous times. Like one, one I did, the detectives like, I have gone by this probably 20 times. Didn't see it. Yeah. So how would you? Damn. Yeah. yeah so well there's there's clues but yeah. it's so are they the end all without a doubt no way have i screwed up without a without a doubt yes i have um is it easy to screw up yes it is and and it's kind of like don't tell me just you know i i look at it as the four corners of the warrant right if we're here because of these clues don't tell me to search the state right because clearly it's on the universe it's in the country it's maybe in this county it might be on the side of this mountain, but the smaller your area, the better chance I have of finding it, right? So the more narrow, but then, and then if the conditions are wrong, like I use the analogy, if you're trying to use a flashlight and have it be valuable at high noon, it's not gonna be. If you're using a flashlight at midnight and facing it the wrong way, it's not gonna help. So, you know, there's, there's gotta be things that work and you have to use the resource well, um, but at the same time, you have to kind of, be responsive to what people want so it's i don't know it's um maybe i, I think i'm a little bit too analytical i make too much out of it. that might be my thing <laughs> so in the beginning of the podcast when you're talking about your your um 
where you're at currently and everything you started a when you got out you started a dog training business um what is that called sonia's dog training because i have no imagination <laughs> it's pretty good though i yeah. mean yeah it's kind of like it's sonia i figured it would make it easy right <laughs> jazz hands it's sonia <laughs> there you go so yeah uh, yeah um is that encompass everything you're doing this uh no so that was so i figured you know i gotta do something so that was pet dog training and then I started nose work because obviously detection's my thing. And I cannot tell you how much these nose work dogs have taught me. It, it's just, it's not what I expected. I thought, okay, whatever. Unbelievable skills gained from working dogs that have zero drive to great drive, right? Because I get some little duchies that come and I get some border collies that come. And then I get like a 10 year old pug. And if you can get them all, so I learned insane like I had a blind dog I had a deaf dog I had a blind and deaf dog I had a three-legged dog I mean it's pretty fun to just relax and take time and let them figure it out and let them be cognitive through it and let them decompress and then they start to love it so it's kind of, I've I've really learned a lot about just don't stress over it just let it happen so set it set them up for success they'll have success and so that was really fun. And I'm a judge, you know, for the, the UKC nose work competitions. And so I do that periodically. And then I run through that business. Like I have a couple of um, cadaver seminars coming up in May that I've booked out a um, couple of weekends. And then I'm going to a couple of seminars. I'm going to a full body seminar and just to keep my skills up. Ooh. And then, then I, with Steve, I did sort of the protection dog thing. And then we're now we're just kind of getting that American tactical aggregate thing going and, you know, hoping that that can turn into something. So Steve's the tactical side and obviously all of his cool friends, if you go on the website, mm -hmm. um, who have been there, done that beyond fathomable. It makes me feel like a kindergartner when I'm around those people because I'm <laughs> like, what the hell have I been doing? <laughs> um, and then I sort of, um, detection's my thing. I love it. I absolutely love it. And I, and with the sport, I really do. I learned a lot from the sport work on the precision and the timing and, and, you know, take breaking it down and not trying to do everything all at once. Right. Yeah. So it's sort of this compilation of things. Right. And um, really paying attention to the dogs. I think that's what I'm probably best at as opposed to making, I'm not good at have to, I'm really good at want to getting the dogs to want to. Mm. So so now the big thing is social media, of course, it's where everybody looks up everybody. Where, <laughs> where can people find you though? Um, so ATAC, um, ATAC9, it's on Instagram. It's um, ATA.K9 and it's on Facebook. Um, and then so I use dog training is on both of those. Although I go under Heimdeller Canine Ranch. Um, so we're on Instagram and Facebook. I'm not, you know, I'm not cute wearing yoga pants, making a dog heel. And, you know, so um, it's, it's not the most... I'm showing my age. Mm. <laughs> I'm not very good at it. And I don't have anybody doing it for me. And, you know, so, and uh, I just kind of want to work dogs. I don't want to worry about the other stuff. Yeah. So, uh, canine Top Tales. We've said it, you know, 20 times on this. Go thanks. check it out. Canine <laughs> Top Tales. It's it's a good podcast. If you guys are like, you like dog podcasts and good guests, it's a, it's a good, it's good entertainment too. There's, a, you know, like when, when, Steve was on there. It was, it was cool to hear you guys. It was a little bit inside joke here and there, but you know, he could tell that you guys knew each other forever, but now we know why. Yeah. Um, yeah. And he's stuck with me. I told him when he gave me the dog, he'd be stuck with me for life. That's yeah. the way it goes. And I'm you each know each other's dogs names and, and all that stuff. So that stuff's pretty cool. But, yeah. um, so on, uh, it's on so Sonia's dog training where you post seminars that you're going to host. Yes. So uh, believe it or not, I tend to post my seminars on Facebook mm -hmm. and I don't do a ton of people. I keep it really small. So it yeah. was two of them were full back to back in 24 hours. And then, you know, That's awesome. so I tend to, most of my stuff for even my little workshops, I haven't done any nose work workshops because of COVID and I do them at my home and I don't really want COVID in my home. So I've been I need to get back into the nose work. I had, I had like six workshops totally booked out and then COVID hit and I had to cancel them all. And so I need to kind of get back into it a little bit. I've been sort of slacking. 
and it's kind of fun to slack a little bit. Yeah, but little, every once in a while, yeah. The cadaver's great, and like I set stuff up ahead, and I let it sit for a few days, and take them to a bunch of different places, and and kind of work on stuff. So it's you know I like doing that, and it's to me it's purposeful, right? Because you're helping. Be, and in fact, one of the gals that came last year, um, her dog just nailed somebody. He just got it. It was great. I mean, wow. so it not that I didn't make that happen, but I'm just yeah. saying like all, she had called me the week before all upset because she had had a circumstance and the dog didn't seem to perform. And I said, I don't think it's a problem, blah, blah, blah. And then the next week she called me and said, we just found a guy. So I'm like, <laughs> so it matters, right? Because if someone's missing, um, would you not go to the ends of the earth to find them? Yeah. No, that's kind of what we do. That's, that's amazing. What about you, Ted? Where can you be found online? Uh, Ted underscore summers at the Instagrams. Um, Torchlight K9, letter K number nine. Uh, Torchlight Pets. Um, there's a picture of me holding a party Yorkie today on there. Um, I didn't know what this was. It's apparently a color, but, uh, yeah, he's cool. Um, and then HRD police K nine letter K number nine. And then the podcast is working underscore dog underscore radio. Um, yeah. So that's where to find me torchlight and mine is basically mostly police stuff. So police and HRD and that kind of stuff and podcasts. So. Pets is all the fluffy, dumb, fun dogs. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I'm over at Van S Canine on Instagram and Facebook. Um, pet, that's the police side. The pet side is Ridge Side Canine Ohio on Facebook. RS Canine Ohio on Instagram. I don't run those. I just comment and share. My manager Amanda runs those too. But um, also check out WorkingDogRadio.com. We have a ton of merch up there, guys. A lot of you bought shirts and everything like that. Ted and I are brainstorming for a couple new uh, T-shirt designs, but we got some really good stuff on there. And um, go check it out. We I will be at uh, Blue Line coming up. Yes, yeah. the next one. Ted and I are teaching, yep. and we'll have a booth. So we have a booth. Be sure to come up and say hi to hang out. Uh, BS. We'll be there. You know, if Ted and I aren't teaching or actually in a class watching, we'll be at the booth. Yeah, somebody so. will be. Yep. Yeah. Yep. All right, Sonia. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. So much. Nice chat. It was awesome. Yes. We there's the, you're good at this. You can tell that <laughs> you're used to a microphone there. You do pretty good. So <laughs> <laughs>